from the city of brotherly love. This is Shark Bite Biz with David Strausser. You did it again. You just arrived to the newest episode of Shark Bite Biz. I'm your rock star wannabe host, David Strasser, and this is your place to learn how to grow business during complete global chaos. As always, this episode is brought to you by our amazing sponsor and SAP Global Platinum Partner, Sador. If your business is ready to move off of QuickBooks, take that next step up. Give us a ring. Help us automate your business processes. That's Sador.com. SAP has a solution for you, whether it's mom and pop, the large enterprise, reach out and let's see how we can help. Now, back to today's episode. We're going to be traveling back into the world about talking about venture capital. You might remember last season we had a guest, Bocardia, with Venture VC. Now we have his counterpart today on the show representing Venture VC. So who do we have today? None other than Maya Benson. Maya has spent over 20 years founding, building, and scaling award-winning SaaS products and platforms for entrepreneurs and SMBs at places like LexisNexis, Pitney Bowles, SendPro platform and apps, that type of stuff, and most recently at Shopify, where over from inception to 60% plus merchant adoption and billions of transportation spent. In addition to her venture work at Forum Ventures, Maya continues to angel invest and advise next-gen e-commerce and logistic tech founders. So hey, without further ado, let's bring Maya right on in here. Business strategy. Maya, welcome to Shark Bite Biz. You, my friend, you just became Shark Bait. David, it's so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having me on today. No, I'm honored to have you here with us because I think you have a lot of good stories to tell us. And uh, we have a tradition on this show. Very first question we ask every single person. Where'd you come from? What do you do for your living? How'd you get there? Basically, in a nutshell, and it's a loaded question, but in a nutshell, what makes Maya, Maya? I love this question, and it's obviously very, very hard. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you maybe a short executive summary, David, and then happy to kind of pull at any of the threads. But, um, you know, the easy stuff is I'm a New Yorker and I'm a venture capitalist. I am six months new to this job. So before that, I spent 20 years building SaaS products and platforms for kind of corporate um, startups and high growth companies. I am deeply, deeply passionate and really what wires me and gets me out of bed every morning is uh, to help uh, drive growth, period, hard stop, right? Either for the product and the company that I am working for in this capacity, helping entrepreneurs and founders and small businesses really find product to market fit um, and and help uh, help you know them drive their growth. So I'm I, I am a passionate, uh, growth driver. And, uh, and maybe I'll just kind of leave that as the quick uh, Maya intro. No, no, that's perfect. And this is the perfect show for you because this is the show about the three G's personal, professional and business growth. So one question that I got that comes out of your your bio there, you said high growth companies. Give me an example of what you consider high growth companies. Yeah, high growth is folks that have kind of found product to market fit and are really in scale mode. So that's the high growth context, right? So, you know, examples are when I joined Shopify, we had found product to market fit. There were entrepreneurs and founders that were um, entering and driving the direct to consumer revolution. So there was an anchor base of merchants there. And we just developed product roadmaps to further accelerate, to reduce the friction that they'd have to grow. Um, and so, so that's that's kind of what high growth meant in a Shopify context. We had an anchor, we had found product fit, and then the challenge and the opportunity was how do we pull more stuff off merchants' plates in the form of product value to help them grow uh, even faster and to help Shopify acquire. Uh, more and more entrepreneurs. That's great because Shopify is probably, I do ERP and there are very few businesses that we work with that do e-commerce that say they want to integrate with something other than Shopify. I mean, we find them every now and then, maybe it's a Magento site or something like that. 
But I'd say 80, 85% of all of them are Shopify websites right now. Yeah. I mean, they are very, very dominant in kind of the small to medium business range. So I'm not at all surprised to hear you say that. And look, they exist to really make commerce easy, really the easy button for all founders. So that's, uh, I think they've done a lot of that really, really well. So one of your, your topics to discuss is navigating the complexity of next gen commerce. What is next gen commerce? You're asking me at a very timely time, David, I'm going to spend this afternoon writing um, a speech just on that, a little talk on that for the Women in Tech Conference. But look, I think there's so many exciting techno technological disruption um, happening today from so many different arenas. And we, we can talk about that, whether it's next generation hardware with VR and robotics and automation to help uh, scale labor, whether it's um, data, data, data. And now with uh, the next generation of AI that we're all probably playing with and integrating. Are you talking about chat GTP? Yeah, that's kind of the metaphor for this, like, you know, large language model, um, really generative AI, whether it's it's text or image. I actually had fun last night on Dolly building some images for this talk. But um, you know, I think what's exciting is this starts to democratize and scale even more the ability of companies to process large amounts of data. And so what that does for commerce is, you know, inevitably drives more and more personalized experiences, right? And our interfaces for how we think about commerce and how we interact with commerce then become next generation wearables like glasses. So kind of two top of mind examples. Like the Google Glass that failed that everybody hated. Right. So Apple's working on their next generation. Glass holes. Glass holes, they were called. That's right. Yeah, so look, first first great hack, and I think the technology will get better and better. In our lifetimes, we will lose this phone as our primary interface. It's going to become something else that can help us interface with the real world um, with a little bit more of a, an intelligent digital overlay or set of interactions. I had Google Glass when it first came out and uh, I, I played with it for a couple of weeks and then resold it for five times more than what I bought it for. And uh, because it was so hard to get invite only at that time for people that remember Google Glass, what... Uh, probably 10 years ago-ish now, I, I would say. Um, but I tell you what, that experience alone, using those glasses were, um, it was amazing. I mean, there's no way to put it. Like I have Google Maps driving uh, through these glasses and I'm seeing the hologram image on my glasses. And it was it was kind of surreal. Like it felt really future tech, like, holy cow, you know? And then the way that they had the audio was you didn't have earbuds or anything like that. They were actually through bone conducting uh, speakers that sat in the rim of the glasses. And it was, it was really, really incredible. And when people think, Oh, well, having maps in, you know, your eye, isn't that distracting? No, because he actually had to kind of uh, glance down or if you wanted to, you can kind of look a little bit more up and you'd see that and still see the road. Like I had never had one problem uh, driving with it, although in San Diego, and I'm still friends with her today, the lone person I think ever to get a ticket for having Google Glass uh, because of the strict cell phone laws in California did get a ticket for driving while wearing Google Glass, which was kind of insane if you think about it, in, in my point of view at least. Yeah, these breakthrough technologies, sometimes in their first instantiation, they're not perfect. But to your well said point, David, your whole mental model and your mind has shifted now to what could be possible if it, it's done better and right. And so there's tons of investment going into making next gen versions of those glasses and maybe it's contacts, we're gonna find out. Uh, but the, the, the net punchline is all of this technology is getting more democratized um, 
and uh, made and, and and that will have just next generation platform revolution opportunities for folks, not just in commerce, but small businesses, you know, uh, in in other industries as well, health, legal. Yeah, so it's it's really going to be uh, impactful and uh, really exciting. That said, there needs to be really active dialogue about the power of what happens when we get closer to kind of a digital and physical world experience, right? What happens when we unleash all this AI to drive hyper-personalized hyper experiences and how we take care and, and ensure trust um, and security of that data. So there's a, there's a whole nother set of conversations and regulations and collabor collaborations that have to happen at a public private level. But uh, but all you know, all this is coming, and there's 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 parts of it that are very very exciting. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot out there too. I was kind of bummed. It seems like uh, Microsoft with um, what were they called? The uh, Hololens, I believe, if I remember correctly. I don't know that I caught that one. You caught that one? What do you mean? I don't know that that ever hit my radar. Oh, okay, okay. You don't know that you caught it. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, they had that, which was supposed to be like the next gen work type uh, enterprise thing, and I don't know. It seems like it went to the to the wayside. That seemed promising. I mean, Meta right now, we got the Meta Quest Two with the VR headset because, to me, ten years ago when I last tried VR compared to trying VR now, it was like, holy cow, this is a totally different experience. But um, Meta is a little bit in disarray right now. So I don't know if that opens a door for competitors or what exactly. Yeah, I think on the headset specific subject, I think there's a lot of competitors. I think Apple's investing a ton here as well. Um, anyway, this will continue and continue to get better and accelerate. And uh, I think the applications that will come behind it will just fundamentally radically change us as consumers and us as professionals. I think personally, I think the, I don't know, how can I say this nicely? Um, the like, okay, for example, let's use cell phones. You have iOS, you have Android, totally incompatible. You know, Siri doesn't work with Google. Uh, Cortana, well, Cortana works with Alexa and a lot of other things. I guess that's a, a little bit different. Microsoft took a different approach after having Cortana as a standalone really didn't work. But I think with these headsets, glasses, how companies are going to find success is really going to be more of an open infrastructure, meaning that anybody can like, like the same type of platform or materials to where apps are intercompatible with each devices. Cause if you have it locked down, like you do with the cell phones right now, I think it's going to make it harder for them to be adopted and to grow. Yeah. I, I hope to your point that some of the closed loop systems and platforms, uh, really start to get regulated and open up because to your point, that's how all of us are going to win with innovation, right? The more, yeah, the more access and open platforms there are, the more innovation can be built. Okay. So what about the customer experience? Okay. Customer experience means a lot. I guess, I guess you could say it's a lot different than what it was 10 years ago where a Yelp review could just, uh, you know, destroy your business. Uh, and it still can to a degree, but I think we're far beyond just that itself. How can you win the customer experience? How can people win the customer experience? So like first principles, you have to be very, very, very embedded and very, very close in building your products with customers. Like if you don't have that foundation and, and if you're not using your product development process and including customers in the flywheel of development, like you're, that, that's just not a great way to build any product, including software. So I think, I think at a first principles level, you have to live and be um, deeply connected to your customers whoever they are. A lot of people over engineer things and it looks great on paper, but in real life, it doesn't work as good. hundred percent, right? We can't birth technology inside out. It has to be built outside in with, with those customers. So I think that's a really important first principle. And then like continuing that, 
everyone in the company, including the CEOs, should be using the, the products and, and services, right? They have to be consumer themselves. So they get also that empathy, not from building with their customers, but actually being a customer. Like, you know, it surprised me when I read two months ago that the CEO of Uber had just gone out for uh, a day to drive rides. And I think he's been in that job six, seven years. So, you know, those practices where all employees can be hyper-connected to the experience, I think is the right first thing that that everyone should be employing. I believe it was Airbnb as well, too. Uh, there, I believe the last couple of weeks I've seen articles about how the Airbnb uh, CEO was staying at some of the properties in the listings and learning a lot of you know, firsthand experience as far as what guests go through, as far as what hosts go through. And that's kind of critical because a lot of times leaders are in an echo chamber, you know, or maybe not an echo chamber, but a silo, you know, high horse, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, everything is abstract, right? It's abstract. It's not a human connected, empathy driven uh, DNA level understanding. So, so I think that has to be true for, for companies of all sizes. Um, so I think that's, you know, with that anchor, then to your larger point, like how does somebody win the, the customer experience? There's so many different technologies and approaches that you can layer on to win the customer experience, but because you're building it with and for your customers and you yourself are a customer, you're going to know better what to bring in to solve problems to your point you know we don't need to you know bring a hammer to a nail or we don't need to over engineer something or maybe sometimes we don't even need to automate something because there's a human touch there that's only going to be able to engage and resolve the experience need so i i don't think there's one prescription i just think you have to deeply deeply understand your customers needs totally agree so another one of your points that intrigued me was as far as supply chain innovation as everybody here knows during covid we you know had a lot of issues with supply chain over the last couple of years i mean look at even things i remember what was it a year and a half ago I did an episode with Lisa Anderson and it was on the supply chain and it's like, why are store shelves empty? And obviously I got a lot of trolls in Twitter, like, Oh, where do you live in the middle of nowhere in the mountains, you know, you know, hillbilly or, or things like that. It was kind of ignorant type, um, you know, comments. And my response to them was, okay, tell me what store has an Xbox Series X or a PlayStation 5 in stock right now. And I will gladly drive there, regardless of where it is, and purchase it. And there were none. And people were trying to oversimplify that issue. And supply chain is something that is crucial to our economy, to our national security, to all of that stuff. In fact, I just heard a speech from uh, Mickey, I, I forget her last name. She's Congresswoman from uh, New Jersey when I was at the Maid in New Jersey uh, State of the State Expo, uh, State of the State Address, I guess you can call it. And she was talking about supply chain manufacturing, all the manufacturing in Jersey, stuff like that. It was a great speech about supply chain, supply chain innovation, and also connecting you know, New Jersey suppliers with other New Jersey suppliers, creating that B2B environment so that people can buy stuff from like, hey, I'm an ice cream maker and I can't find cups. You know, how can I buy cups at an affordable price that are made in New Jersey instead of buying them from China? So how do you think the supply chain innovation will happen within our country? Because I do think that's a that's a hot issue coming up Uh you know, right now. It's a massive issue. And I totally agree with you. It actually also boils down to national security. I think that was a really important call out you made. I think the best way to kind of talk about um, how folks are, you know, rebuilding and retooling their supply chain is to kind of go back in time for a second together and, and really identify the first principles of what broke, right? Because once, once we do that, we can now talk about the future and what's getting fixed. 
But what broke, there's, there's two big things that broke, right? Number one, China shut down. Okay, so you literally had the source of supply go offline. They had a zero COVID policy until two months ago. Okay, so like that happened. So manufacturing shut down, bye-bye supply. At the same time, as you and I both know, David, we were holed up in our homes. And so demand shot up. And there was obviously some panic buying that got in the mix of this too. But like those two key first principles are what drove a lot of the pain you and I lived, not just the next generation PlayStation, but literally to your point, finding cups and paper towels and toilet paper and like some pretty basic stuff. And so I think what you're, you're seeing now excitingly is if China breaks or goes offline, what's our plan? Right. So I think folks are retooling to optimize for resiliency over cost. Right. So this means diversification in their manufacturing suppliers. Right. So how do we have China and, you know, a rotation? And then candidly, since China is just geographically so far away, I think there's also a retooling of if we're going to have multiple suppliers, how do we also get them? you know, uh, very, you know, much closer, if you will, to home, right? How can they be a truck away and not an ocean away? So I think there's, some people call this near shoring. So I think there's some really exciting um, retooling and resiliency um, that's coming in through. The I lived in Mexico for 15 years, and I'm a huge fan of the USMCA, or as other people know it as NAFTA. Um, and for me, I, I think, um, you know, instead of giving all that money and dominance and, and power to China itself, um, maybe we prop up our, our neighbors to the South, maybe we prop them up to the North because even manufacturing in Canada for the most part is going to be cheaper than the United States with the currency exchange and all that stuff. And there's no tariffs to bring things between U.S., Mexico, and and Canada. So it, to me, I think that's the simplest solution. Focus on that. And then simultaneously, kind of like a multi-track mind, think of North America as one and then also United States as secondary because what I learned during that um that interview I did with Lisa Anderson that I, I referenced earlier is that, you know, you have to know your supplier, 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 but you also have to make sure that you caution that you don't get into what she called analysis paralysis to where you're just analyzing too much detail and data. And, you know, you got to cut it off somewhere, but you have to give yourself a sense of security that, hey, what's my plan A, plan B, plan C? And also make sure that you're ordering materials. Maybe you're getting 80% from your plan A, but you're still getting maybe 15% from plan B and 5% and from plan C. So that way they're always ready you know, they're manufacturing your your parts, your equipment, your tools. And that way, then if ever plan A starts to fail, perhaps plan B and C can, you know, up the demand and carry some of that slack. I couldn't agree with you more. There's tremendous North American opportunities as well as specifically. And it's so interesting, David, that you lived in Mexico for, for over a decade. Like Mexico is so well positioned to drive next generation um, infrastructure for near shoring. Um, but there's work to be done, right? There's a port that needs, um, you know, uh, some some growth and some investment. There's road infrastructure. Um, there's, there's a lot that needs to be done to help them grow up, to have the capacity and the capabilities to serve really candidly the the opportunity. So I, I couldn't agree more. I think if you do it, so where I, I, I agree and disagree at the same time, I agree that if you get deeper into Mexico, that might be the truth. However, I think if you're more along the border region, uh, I view that quite mature because of the fact that they have the ports of entries right there. I mean, in, in San Diego with the Tijuana border, you have the Otay Mesa border, which is the commercial port of entry. You That's the sweet spot, but that in order to handle the volume, 
there, there, there needs to be investment. Yeah, no, there needs to be investment in terms of, I mean, right now, you, I don't know about right now. Okay. I, a couple years ago when I lived down there, you're, you're talking a couple hours to maybe even a day until a truck could get fully passed through customs. But, you know, and, and people don't realize that, uh, that border region is, uh, is critically important to our economy. I mean, just San Diego alone, I think it used to be five or six uh, billion with a B dollars that was in commerce being done at that border every single day. So even though you have all those goods that were, you know, maybe they're being manufactured at, see, this is a very nuanced conversation. I get very animated about it because people be like, oh, you're taking our job, sending them to Mexico. Okay, yes, we are. But in return, like a pair of Levi's down there, I mean, they used to cost, maybe they got a little cheaper because it's been a couple of years since I've lived there, but they could cost 60, 70, 80, 90 bucks, okay, for a pair of Levi jeans that we buy at Walmart for $20, okay? So what happens is that all the Mexicans that do work in those factories that do get that money, what do they do? They get visas and then they come back up into San Diego, whether it's weekly, whether it's monthly, and usually with money from their family. And they end up buying in San Isidro and Chula Vista and San Diego. And then they bring all those goods back down to Mexico. So kind of it, it goes full circle, the money, a lot of times. And I think people kind of overlook that but because it does send some higher higher quality jobs, I guess you could say, of manufacturing down to Mexico, but it also brings back and supports a lot of our retail industry in exchange. The reason why America has schools and roads and um, access to health, you know, uh, you know, first first world health care is because we drive a global multi-trillion dollar economy and uh, and and um, to your point, uh, that global economy driving all the wealth to the United States, um, by definition, requires multiple sources of labor, both within, within our country as well as without. So that's kind of point one. Point two, to your point, specifically on did we outsource jobs, uh, I think in a lot of cases, we outsourced uh, well too many manufacturing jobs at the peril and at the risk of stuff like fundamentally national security, right? So like we need to regrow that muscle. There's tremendous opportunity to do that. It's going to look different than what it has been in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, right? Technology has had a lot of value to help labor even do more. But, um, you know, I, I think there's kind of two points I think we all need to remember. One, we like being the richest country in the world, and that's you know, we, we only win it when we win at a global level. Um, two, uh, we do need to bring back, you know, core manufacturing. What it's going to mean, the other thing we all, all also need to think about is when you bring it back on shore, because we're the richest country in the world, wages go up. So so things are going to get more expensive. So I think that's, that's a trade that we're all going to have to get used to, which which may be a good thing. Like, do we need all the stuff that we buy? Probably not. Did China make it super cheap so we all bought it? Yes, they did. So anyway, uh, so it's it's going to be an interesting evolution going forward that you know was sparked by I think the litmus of of COVID and candidly now the the macro geo geopolitical dynamics that are that are happening yeah yeah no i totally totally agree with you so i got one final question to wrap up with you okay and uh, the talking point of the day all you've heard the last couple years are how evil venture capitalists are in your own words are venture capitalists evil? Give me your take. Why did I join uh, the investment side and leave the operator world? I mean, I think there were really two big opportunities that I saw that I got really excited about. One, um, it's not fair to say all venture capitalists are the same, right? So Forum very much has an early stage model where we not only invest capital, 
but we invest ourselves. We've got a team of 27 people that wake up every morning to help our founders and hold their hands to go, you know, from pre-seed to seed, right? So what that means is operator intros, advisor intros, helping them co-define their go-to-market strategies and product strategies, helping them fundraise. Nobody's born knowing how to raise venture capital. So I think I think I found a great fit at a first principles level of sure you can be a great investor, but it's also I think in order to do that, um, founders need help. It's also a bit self-serving, David, because we believe that founders that want help and ask for help actually outperform, right? So so we do think there's a deep deep correlation, you know, between our business model and the yield that we're able to provide our investors and our LPs. So that's that's one big thing that I think was important for me. And then the second that kind of dovetails on that is, um, uh, and I, I guess I'm just repeating the point again, but we don't just invest, right? So for Maya, it was incredibly important to take next-gen e-com logistics and supply chain experience and knowledge and really you know, help founders with that deep reference point of building SaaS products and platforms for, for many, many years. Um, and, and then most recently in that domain. So I think those are the reasons. So I think like, so venture capital is not one thing. I think that's the most important kind of headline to take away. And are there, are there, you know, stories out there and kind of aggressive. There's bad actors everywhere. Right, exactly. But just, um, you know, if your audience takes anything away, just please know, like, not everybody's the same. Venture capital's too opaque. It's not caught up with the times yet in terms of how we invest in diverse founders. So, you know, all of us are, you know, that are joining from an operator world or from diverse backgrounds are trying to chip away at, chip away at this to make it more accessible. One last question that just came to the top of my head. You, you said SaaS now a couple of times. Do you think people are starting to get subscriptioned out? Do you think SaaS is still the marketplace of the future? It's a great question. Like, you know, we invest in kind of business to business SaaS. So I think businesses uh, absolutely have kind of already made the mature. I think I think SaaS, like cloud, cloud delivery of value is mature. So I think that, that ship is sailing uh, strongly. So I'm pr proud to be in the tailwinds and the growth still of SaaS. So that, that's kind of a B2B lens. David, to your consumer question, like are you and I as consumers kind of sick and tired of paying for a lot of uh, subscriptions? My answer is hell yes. It feels like being nickel and dime. I know. And I think we're going to see literally in the next year or two um, a lot of um, uh, aggregation of value, especially if we think about it in like a media world, right? Like I don't know about you, but I think I have seven streaming subscriptions. <laughs> Probably same here. Yeah. And like bring back the cable model, please. Right. So, so I think that's going to start to get rationalized. Partnerships are going to be made. Um, at, at least I hope because the consumer experience is becoming way too fragmented and too expensive. Well, I just read YouTube TV, I believe is now the third or fourth uh, largest cable provider in the United States. You know, we were not consumers of YouTube TV until about five months ago. And I'm not going to lie. I have to say I'm very impressed. I, I love it too. Although I put it on hold because we don't really watch TV except for football. So it, it it's on hold until football season. And then uh, with the price increase, it was like, uh, you know, we'll just wait until August and I'll turn it back on again. So it, it was all good for me. It makes all the sense of the world. And as you just said, football is literally the thing that's been holding up TV. It has been. We lived through a, a time together, David, where we've had big corporations that have delivered stu stuff to us, be it media, be it products like via commerce to this mass fragmentation where everybody could create content, video or text, anyone can stand up a store a la Shopify. And so then we went, we've dispersed and now we're living in that world of hyper fragmentation. And that's actually starting to come back together again because of a lot of the privacy um, laws that Apple and about to be Google and California have put in place making cost of acquisition to buying you and I, the consumer, um, really, really prohibitive. So we've lived through this like consolidation with a few channels to an explosion of everybody can build it themselves. 
And now I think we're going to go back to, uh, you know, things are going to start to collapse. That is awesome. And people of the show, you will probably have remembered probably last season at this point, but uh, we've had uh, Bokar on this show as well, too. Awesome. From, also from Forum Ventures. But anyways, uh, Maya, please do us a favor. Where can people find out more about you, your LinkedIn, you know, your personal stuff, as well as your business? Tell us whatever you want to tell us about you and how people can get in touch. Thank you so much, David. Yeah, definitely hit me up on LinkedIn. That's probably the best front door to find me. You can also find me at Maya at forumvc.com. So those are two, two uh, great areas, David. And, you know, we are looking to uh, partner with uh, B2B SaaS founders in kind of that pre-seed and seed stages. So really welcome the opportunity to meet y'all and uh, looking forward to, to connecting. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much, Maya. This was amazing. Please check out her LinkedIn page. It'll be down below as well as a link to Forum Ventures. Maya, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your expertise. Totally love the chat. Yeah, great to meet you, David. Thanks so much for having me. No problem. Cheers. That was an incredible chat with Maya, right? First, though, you all know the routine. If you found this interview helpful, if it sparked those warm and fuzzies, do me a favor. Hit that like button. Smash that subscribe button. But if you really want to help us out because you know Shark Bite Biz is the greatest kept secret in the world of small business, please share us out to your friends, your colleagues, uh, your parents, you, you know, wh whoever you can. Anywhere that you dwell on the interweb, Reddit, to Facebook, to I keep wanting to say Twitter, but it's X now to wherever you want to go. Share it out. Help get the word of Shark Bite Biz. And please, my goal for the month of August, let's get more engagement. Instead of sending me emails, okay, which I'm going to ask you to at the end of this, you know, segment anyways, instead of sending me emails, let's start putting those email requests on the actual you know forums like spotify and on youtube so that we can start having some engagement i'd love to hear your voices in a public sense not so much a private sense if you all don't mind anyways let's let that go now let's get back to the real rock star of the show Maya, this was a great show talking about the complexity of the next gen e-commerce to winning the consumer experience and even touching on supply chain innovation. Venture capital isn't as evil as they make it seem on the news. Okay, sure, there's some bad players. There's some people that take advantage, but often they help the next generation of tech lift its way off the ground and help build it faster and further so that we all can benefit from this new technology that's being built. So anyways, awesome stuff, Maya. Thank you so much for coming on, sharing your experience, being so personal with you know everything that you told us. And please check out her company, Forum Ventures. It's forumvc.com. Please check that out. Check her out on uh, LinkedIn, anywhere you want to connect with her. I'm sure she's open. Question of the day, do you still think VC is evil? Yes or no? You answer on Spotify, on YouTube. Please leave comments out there. Like I just said, I'd love more engagements. Do you want to be on the show? Well, let me know on an episode. Comment that you want to be on the show on an episode, and I will put you to the front of the line. Alternately, you can send an email to interviews at sharkbitebiz.com. We do have quite a long list of people, but I'm throwing a spiff out there. If you comment on an episode that you want to be on the show, I'll get you on the show. Lastly, if you want to help the show, three bucks a month, you can be a baby shark on YouTube or if you go to Spotify, but not the Spotify app. You have to go to the podcasters for Spotify uh, site and I believe the RSS feed. You can find that on the SharkBiteBiz.com website. Uh, I should probably get the link down there in the description soon so that way you can spot us on YouTube or Spotify, whichever you prefer. And lastly, we have to shout out to our sponsor, Sador. That's S-E-I-D-O-R. If you're a big, huge fan of tech, you love tech, but you're tired of using Excel spreadsheets and you want one system to run your entire business from A to Z, I'm telling you, SAP has a solution for me. Whether you're mom and pop or large enterprise, Sador can help you find the right fit that can get you off QuickBooks and get you onto one system to manage your business. 
You all know this, but I'll tell you once again, I'm David Strasser. This is Shark Bite Fizz. We'll see you all next episode. Ciao. You just experienced Shark Bite Biz with David Strausser. Please like, comment, and subscribe to the show to help us spread the word about personal, professional, and business growth. Want to be on the show? Send an email to interviews at sharkbitebiz.com. A special shout out to our sponsor, SAP Platinum Partner, Sador. Get off QuickBooks and move your business to the next level. Reach out for more info. Thanks for listening and see you next time.